Thank you very much. I'm a final year Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Training Fellow, and on behalf of myself and my group, we thank the organisers very much for the opportunity to present this work on IGSF 10 and its role in self-limited delayed puberty. We have no disclosures. Puberty is the critical developmental stage when reproductive capacity is attained. And its onset is driven by an increase in the pulsatile release of gonadotrophin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Prior to puberty, there is a central inhibitory break in place, which is relaxed during puberty to allow the increase in GnRH-releasing hormone and furthermore downstream an increase in gonadotrophins and then sex storage that drives the pubertal process. In girls, the onset of puberty is heralded by breast buds, and in boys, by an increase in testicular volume to four millilitres. And what we do know is that the timing of the onset of puberty is closely um, correlated with, between twins, within families, and within ethnic groups. And from such twin studies, we estimate that 60 to 80% in the variability of the timing, in pu uh, timing of puberty is genetically determined. Well, why is this important? Well, firstly, significantly early or significantly late puberty affects up to 5% of adolescents. And secondly, very early or very late puberty is associated with multiple medical and psychosocial adverse sequelae. And thirdly, given that we know that there has been a clear secular trend towards an earlier timing of puberty in the general population, this association with increased cancer, diabetes, hypertension and obesity clearly has an important public health impact. So in the, normal, in the general population, there is a near normal spectrum of the timing of onset of puberty. And though we know that a lot of this is genetically determined, what we don't know is what these genetic factors are. Attempts to answer this question have ranged from genome-wide association studies of the age of menarche in the general population which has gained insight into about 5 to 10% of the variability of timing of puberty, to the identification of a small number of genes, mutations in which cause absolute GnRH deficiency, also known as hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Our, our group's focus has been on a cohort of patients with extremely delayed puberty at the extreme end of the normal population in whom we hypothesize that high impact variants are likely to be enriched. So the starting point of my PhD project, sorry, I apologize. This cohort is very large, has been collected over 20 years, and is highly accurately phenotyped, such that we have over 400 individuals from 170 families and their unaffected, unaffected relatives. So the starting point of my project was whole exome sequencing in over 100 individuals from these 18 families. And the variants returned were filtered through a classic bioinformatic pipeline, identifying um, mutations that are rare, predicted deleterious, and that segregate with trait within each family. And moreover, I looked for genes with variants in more than one family that had biological relevance to the phenotype of delayed puberty. And I identified a top candidate gene list, which I took forward for targeted resequencing in a further 42 pack families from our cohort. I then applied statistical testing to identify those with highly significant p-values. And one of the genes identified, IGSF10, had four variants in 10 families. And I've been able to validate two of those in six families as definitively pathogenic in in vitro studies. So to give you some more information on IGSF10 or immunoglobulin superfamily member 10, it encodes a very large protein of close to 300 kilodaltons, the exact function of which has not been elucidated, and there are no previously known human mutations. Of the four variants that I identified, two are clustered at the N-terminus within leucine-rich repeats, and two in the C-terminus within immunoglobulin-like domains. And all four are rare, predicted, predicted to be deleterious both by software tools and also our own in silico analysis, and affect highly conserved residues. When we looked at the segregation in the families with these, with these variants, they followed the typical autosomal inheritance pattern that one would expect in families with self-limited delayed puberty, with a near-perfect segregation. And examining the growth pattern in these probands, again, they had the typical features of self-limited delayed puberty, 
with near normal growth in childhood, but only falling off the centiles at the point which they are expected to go in, into puberty as compared to their peers, and they don't, so they fail to have a pubertal growth spurt. So what was the impact of these mutant proteins? Well, I was able to identify one paper that gave evidence for a putative cleavage site with secretion of the N-terminal product of the protein. So I expressed in mammalian cells the wild type and the two N-terminal mutations. And what I saw is that while all three were clearly expressed in the intracellular compartment, only the wild type could be detected in the supernatant. And um, the two mut mutant proteins appeared to be uh, retained within the intracellular compartment. So I wanted to gain insight into what role IGSF10 might be playing in the timing of puberty. And I examined some developmental tissue expression. Firstly, in mice embryos. GNRH neurons are truly remarkable in that they don't originate within the brain, but they, they originate at the tip of the nose and migrate backwards towards the hypothalamus during embryogenesis. And here you can see a sagittal image at E10.5. I couldn't detect IGSF10 staining, but GNRH neurons are also not detectable at this stage. Whereas by E12.5, you can clearly see in brown staining a GNRH neuron within the vomeronasal nasal organ where they're known to originate, migrating outwards into nasal mesenchyme stained here, strongly in purple for IGSF10. And it's almost as if the GNRH neuron is being enticed to begin its migrational journey by this IGSF10 staining. And we saw this all the way through the period where GNRH neurons migrate up through this corridor of nasal mesenchyme towards the olfactory bulbs. And by E17.5, GNRH neurons are, um, are completely within the forebrain. We saw no staining for IGSF10 within the forebrain. That's the sense image for comparison. And what was interesting was that GNRH staining was very similar, sorry, IGSF10 staining was very similar to other known chemokines, such as SDF1. SDF1 knockout in mice leads to complete failure of GNRH neurons to migrate out of the nasal region. And I was able to recapitulate this data in human embryos at a similar stage when GNRH neurons are migrating. And I saw again this staining for IGSF10 in the nasal mesenchyme with the sense as comparison. So in order to try and test this hypothesis that the IGSF10 signaling might be important for GNRH neuronal migration, I devised an in vitro assay. GN11 cells are a form of GNRH neuron. They're immortalized, immature, migratory neurons. And I used NIH3T3 fibroblasts as a model for nasal mesenchyme, as they have high endogenous um, expression of IGSF10. And I used SHRNA to knock down, uh, with a good effect, IGSF10 in NIH3T3 with a scrambled as a control. And then I plated hanging droplets of these GN11 cells either on a monolayer of scrambled or no IGSF10 knockdown NIH3T3, with a significantly reduced migration in the IGSF10 knockdown environment. And then I wanted to try and recapitulate this in vivo, so we identified a collaborator in Tel Aviv who have a zebrafish um, transgenic line with fluorescent marking of GNRH3 neurons, which at 48 hours are seen as bright dots, and then over the following three days post post-fertilization, extend these organized projections back to the hypothalamus. We saw that IGSF10 was strongly expressed in zebrafish from 48 hours and used morpholino modified antisense oligonucleotides to knock down IGSF10 in these zebrafish embryos and observe the effect on the development of the GNRH system. And what we saw with both the splice site morpholino and the ATG morpholino as compared to control panels here and here was that GNRH neurons were scattered and disorganized and they failed to project um, back into the hypothalamus in any sort of ordered projections. And these were highly significant results. So in summary, I presented evidence today for IGSF10, a novel gene implicated in self-limited delayed puberty. I've identified four variants in 10 unrelated families, which are rare and highly conserved. Knockdown of IGSF10, both in vitro and in a zebrafish model, led to aberrant GNRH neuronal migration. And this is the first time that misregulation of GNRH neuronal migration 
during embryonic development has been identified as a causal mechanism in delayed puberty. Well, what are the wider implications of this? Well, if one can identify the key genetic factors that determine the time of puberty, clearly that will aid the diagnosis and management of our patients. But moreover, the understanding of the, sec of the, the factors that underpin the secular trend towards earlier timing of puberty in the population will also have important public health implications. I'd like to thank you for your attention, to thank my supervisors, my group, and of course, my finding bodies.